The next talk is entitled Models of Dynamo Induced E Fields by S. V. Venkateswaran. Venki? You may wish to consider this talk as some sort of an appendix to Professor Rishpet's talk. What I shall do here is to give you some quantitative <coughs> estimates of electric fields calculated from a numerical simulation of the atmospheric uh, dynamo. I am going to deal with topics I can see which are already intended to controversy in the previous discussion. I will be happy to contribute to the discussion. And first slide, please. Excuse me, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can I have it? Oh, yes. My very f my first slide gives, shows schematically the manner in which we simulated the dynamo action in the ionosphere. I shall confine my remarks to very quiet days. You will find even then there are complications. We select the quiet day and analyze the geomagnetic data, the H and D components, for a particular universal time. As you shall see, there are significant variations with universal time, and by conventional methods of analysis, derive the ground magnetic potential pattern, or if you prefer to call them, equivalent currents. And then we start with, as far as the theoretical model is concerned, we start with a one particular tidal mode. We shall, I shall assume that the winds in the ionosphere are mainly periodic or tidal in nature, and I shall consider one diurnal mode, which I shall call 1 minus 2, which is the mode which was called by 1, one minus 1 by Dr. Rishpa. There are very good reasons for calling it 1 minus 2, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is a tidal oscillation with 24-hour period. It is an evanescent mode. That means it has to be excited more or less locally in the dynamo region. Then I shall consider three semi-diurnal modes. 2, 2, and 2, 4, both of which are symmetric with respect to the geographic equator, geographic, I emphasize, and then 2, 3, which is asymmetric with respect to the geographic equator. And of course, it is possible that there can be effects due to zonal winds and so on, as has been shown by Van Saber and others, but I shall neglect them in this particular talk, though I will indicate they may be important in the end. So we take one of these tidal modes, we assume, for simplicity, that a geomagnetic field is approximated by a tilted dipole model. Assume further the cross conductivities, that the pedestrian and hall conductivities are known as a function of height, latitude, and longitude. And then crank through to the dynamic equations and derive the current, equivalent current system or the ground magnetic potential pattern for this particular mode. Then, of course, what we attempt is to match the observed ground magnetic potential pattern with the calculated potential pattern. And for that, we assume that we can use a proper combination of these modes. And here I want to emphasize at least the results that we have obtained during quiet days, several quiet days now, seem to indicate, though I cannot claim a mathematical uniqueness for the combination, that the results are sensitive to the wind modes that we use. In other words, I cannot quite agree that the conductivity defect is so predominant that we cannot get any information about the wind system from dynamo simulation. As I shall see, the deductions about the wind system that I get by the indirect uh, diagnosis of the, diagno the dynamo equation agree more or less with what is observed about these individual tidal modes from meteor data. So what I do essentially is to come up with a more or less proper combination of these four tidal modes in such a way that they reproduce more or less on a global scale the ground magnetic potential pattern. We know that near the, near the equator, I assume in this simulation process that the vertical extent of the ionospheric dynamo is very much smaller than the lateral extent, that the geomagnetic field lines in the F region are equipotentials and so on, and that the electric, in other words, any asymmetric tidal driving force will tend to set up uh, will currents, field line currents. We account for that and you'll see that the 2-3 mode is predominantly responsible for the field line current. In order to the remark that the field lines may not be equipotential, on this assumption, we can calculate what kind of an effect you can get 
about the D component of the field at the equator, and many times we find that the D component that we calculate as due to field line currents uh, looks very much like the D component that is observed, which seems to indicate that indeed so these, these, these field line currents play a part in the observed D variation over the equator, which may or may not answer uh, Professor Rishba's uh, criticism about this. So anyway, what we do then is to come up with the proper component of the wind system so that the equivalent currents observed and computed match. And the, then, of course, the electric fields can be derived. And the, what we do here is the electric fields that are derived for, for the appropriate component of the wind system. Generally, in earlier work in dynamo theory, they give you the electric field for one particular tidal mode. We have no guarantee that this matches the, uh, the at least integrated effect as far as the currents are concerned. Next slide, please. The, as this will illustrates the spatial pattern of the different tidal modes indicated, the 1 minus 2, the diurnal mode, the 2, 2, and the 2, 4, which are really symmetric with respect to the equator, and the 2, 3 mode, which is asymmetric. You may, at a region above which dissipation effects are important, they, they become important in the dynamo region actually, you may think of the spatial pattern as fixed, the relative magnitudes of the vectors as fixed. There are for each, with, with respect to each pattern, there are two variables. The pattern with respect to the subsolar point can be rotated around, as you please, and the amplitudes of the vectors can be changed. So for each mode, you have two variables, so that if you use four modes, that we have really eight variables. What we are trying to get is an optimum combination of these eight variables so as to get this integral constraint. Next slide. Yes. Uh, here is uh, the ground magnetic potential pattern, geomagnetic longitude, geomagnetic latitude, on a very quiet day, as you can at a particular universal time, 0930 UT, on 26 June 1964. As you can see, even during a very quiet day, the so-called SQ pattern look, looks very different from what you see in test books. Uh, in fact, this should, be uh, this should be emphasized. On this particular day, or in the Kuchol region, for example, you found the so-called counter-electrogen. That means to say that the electric field actually reversed during daytime. This particular, here we give on the 0930 UT on that particular day, uh, the electric field distribution. Again, in geomagnetic latitude, geomagnetic longitude. And here the lines are the equipotential lines and the vectors are the electric field. And you can see here is the, the, the potential hill and here is the potential valley which is situated somewhere near 42 degrees. Of course, as I said, the electric field is symmetric with respect to the uh, geomagnetic equator in this case. And you will see these positions of these hills and valleys are quite important when we talk about the kind of electric field that will map out into the plasma pause region. For example, north of this location, you will find a clockwise rotation due to the ionospheric electric field, and uh, south of it, you will find an anticlockwise rotation. Generally assume, for example, the ionospheric electric fields generally show a clockwise rotation, but I, we shall see that even during two quiet days, for example, which look very similar, this location quite, quite vary. This variation is due to the day-to-day -day variation of the tidal wind complement, which exists. Uh, my next slide. Here it shows, essentially, the variation on different days, different quiet days, extremely quiet days, of the latitude and longitude of the hills and valleys for different universal time. I shall not get into the details of this. We can discuss it if you like. But there are variations, significant variations of these locations. Yeah, now, what I shall do is to compare the electric fields that I calculate on this quiet day with the general characteristics of the electric field deduced from radar backscatter measurements, and here I shall use measurements from Yakamarka, Arecibo, and Milson Hill. Here, these are essentially applicable to the equatorial region. I should emphasize that the electric field that I derive are of global dimensions. Using this as the primary electric field, I have a numerical model, the equatorial electrojet, so that I can calculate the whole field and also the magnetic variations due to the equatorial electrojet. These calculated variations on individual days for different stations and different longitude sectors, Kodaikanal, Addis Ababa, and Huang Kayo, are shown. All the magnetic fields are shown as full lines. And the open circles of the observations, you can see in general, there is fairly good agreement. You will also see that I have included not only days which look uh, conventional, but also days in which actually you will find uh, what 
is sometimes known as the counter electrojet, where the magnetic field reverses direction and correspondingly there is a reversal of the electric field even during the afternoon hours. So both uh, normal electrojet days and counter electrojet days can be simulated in terms of uh, tidal mechanisms and the electric fields that you derive are given the lower panel. During daytime, of course, you get an electric field of the order of 1 millivolt, one, one millivolt per meter. During nighttime, generally, it reverses. And even such finer features as the morning enhancement uh, in the electric field or the post-sunset enhancements in the electric field can be reproduced fairly well. In this particular case, I may emphasize that these morning enhancements as a result can be produced even by a 24-hour tidal wind component, and they are essentially the result of the uh, conductivity gradients which occur near the terminator region. In other words, many fine features of the equatorial magnetic variations and the electric field measurements can be reproduced by these tidal components. And here, I show similar results uh, for a Arecibo latitude. Here, mainly what I want to point out is the fact that you can see that the electric drift, a east-west electric field, or as the, the drift re reverses direction around about 14 hours or so. This is a feature which has been noted in Arecibo quite often by Harper and others. And you can see that this is essentially a result due to the semi diurnal component of the wind. There is no necessity to invoke plasma spheric electric fields as was done in the interpretation of their the paper. But there are features about Arecibo observations which are not reproduced here, and that is specifically the large, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, at, uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, the, that is not reproduced here. The authors say that this is an 8-hour component of the wind. I have really not looked into that particular problem because, as I say, I have also been concerned about the excitation of these winds rather than merely uh, proposing them. And here I give the kind of results that we get for the IGY and the IQSY period uh, for the electric field or the drift measurements, as the case may be, for the latitude correspond to Milson Hill. As Evans data showed, uh, these, you can see that you can produce a clockwise rotation showing a, uh, the importance of a semi diurnal component pretty well in these observations, and these are seen much better during equinox conditions. These are for individual days. These are for as an average for a large number of quiet days. See that the plasma bit is readily outward between dawn and noon and inward after dusk. This in generally, this is in agreement with what Dr. Carpenter reported in this abstract, in these uh, proceedings. And the kind of magnitude that you get uh, here is something like 0.2 millivolts per meter, either at, at dusk time, it can either be inward or outward, as the case may be. For comparison, you may remember at L is equal to 4, the convection electric field is something like 0.9 millivolts per meter, and the, uh, no, no, and the, the corrotation electric field is something like 0.9 millivolts per meter directly inwards, and the conversion electric, convection electric field, as observed by Dr. Carpenter, either during very quiet times or during periods of substorm, is the order bearing between 0.1 millivolts to 0.4 millivolts per meter. So all the point I wish to make is these things, the ionospheric electric field is somewhat smaller, but they are comparable. They may have some importance as far as the quiet time plasma pause uh, dynamics is concerned. I have more results than this. I can discuss them if you like, but my time is up. Yes. Yes, Professor. Uh, I didn't hear you say at any point uh, what modes you actually introduced and what their relative amplitudes were. The, the <coughs> Which mode modes did thing. you use and what were the relative amplitudes? Yes. Essentially, the relative amplitudes, of course, will vary from day to day. There is day to day variation in the 1 minus 2 mode and the 2 2 mode. And uh, essentially, we found, to give a general answer, that the 2 2 mode, for example, is much more important during solar minimum periods as compared to solar maximum periods. Last week in Australia, I heard a talk from Welford. His meteor observations, which have now been extended, show similar features. That is, the two-two more, his, his now observations, meteor observations, we showed to be more important during solar minimum periods. That is deduced from this kind of analysis. And from day to day, the relative importance of the one minus two and the two-two do vary. 
just make a very brief comment that uh, both at Millstone and St. Santan, uh, the evidence is more or less unequivocal that it's the S24 mode that dominates. Yes, the two, yes, 24 mode two, is quite important too. You yes. said 22, however. No, no, two, I have both 22 and 24. The relative contribution between 22 and 24 also vary. You know, I didn't get involved in the wind analysis, but. Uh, to respect to two-part question, this is Jody. Um, one, how do you get rid of the ring current effects in your magnetic observations? Well, what we have done is to take really very quiet days, and you and you look at the DST values; they are very small indeed. Either they, get, they go negative or small. Yeah, but that's uh, that's a function of the observation system. Well, I think the DST effects, even if you know remove them, you can assume after all, DST effects okay. cannot be that so, different with latitude. Okay, so there, there you chose the quietest days you could find, and you have not removed any specific ring current effects. The second question really is, uh, it seemed to me, well, not a question, a comment, it seemed to me that one of the points you used as confirmation that you were right in choosing the mode you did was that the magnetic observations observed at uh, Addis Ababa and so on matched the, the calculated values that you showed. But weren't those already included in the calculations? That's how you, in fact, chose the coefficients for the modes, is matching no. the observed no, I, in, the, in the original geomagnetic data that I used to derive the global potential pattern, I did I deliberately excluded the equatorial electrogestations. I excluded them. I merely derived the global magnetic equatorial electric global electric field pattern. I used that as a primary field, and then derived the equatorial electrojet, and then compared the equatorial electrojet with the observed magnetic field variations. I made that as a condition to choose my modes also, because you could use an equatorial electrojet as an amplifier, if you like, because you can get it much more sensitive. In other words, that was used as a boundary condition to choose my modes. I did not include the equatorial stations originally in the process. Thank you. In, in quoting wind observations, you were referring to meteorite observations, and aren't they really uh, measuring winds at about 90 kilometers or so? Well, I, you see, the 2-2 two, two and the 2-4 modes are essentially excited in the mesosphere. And I, but all I was, the only thing that I was saying was that there is indication of the variation of the strength between solar maximum and solar minimum. I only okay. specify. Yeah. I, I mean, I just find it hard to relate winds at 90 kilometers to the to the very strong winds above the shear region, above 105, 110. No, you, 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 I'm afraid you have to have a harder problem because the 2-2 and the 2-4 modes are excited somewhere near 50 to 60 kilometers. You will have to relate them to what you observe in the honesty because they do propagate upwards. Yes, but then don't they change in direction? They change in amplitude and direction. Of course, we have, I didn't get involved in it. I have used in these models the effects of various dissipation forces, ion drag, uh, viscosity and heat conductivity and so on. So the basic patterns that I showed is what applies to, say, the base of this model, which is approximately the meteor level. In other words, 80 or 90 kilometers is what the pattern would look like, but the actual winds that I used included the effects of ion drag, viscosity and heat conductivity. We changed this pattern. I didn't get involved in that detail. Here. 